everyone. My name is Kirk Laughlin. I'll be your host today. Uh, very happy to be part of the Do Business Jamaica virtual conference. It's always very, very exciting to be talking about Jamaica's trajectory and BPO services and global services in general. Uh, I'm the managing director of Nearshore Americas. I'm very pleased to be today with Mr. Yanni Epstein. Many of you know him. He's the founding chairman and CEO of the Caribbean's largest homegrown CX provider, ITEL. Uh, Yanni's considered to be one of the most influential executives across the near, entire Nearshore region. He's known for keeping a close eye on creating a business of the future and having an impact that goes beyond profits. Prior to launching uh, ITEL, Yanni developed and managed the worldwide contact center operations for Sandals Resorts International. Through his experience, Yanni could see the potential for the Caribbean to compete on a global scale. And in 2012, Yanni set out on his own to create a new breed of contact centers, which brings us today to, to, to ITEL. So, so with that, I'd like to now uh, just welcome you, Yanni. How, how are things going lately? Good, Kirk. How are you? Very always well. Good, always great to see you. You, you as well. You as well. The years are starting to pile up here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, just to kind of get, get uh, caught up to the here and now, it, it, uh, you know, we, we've seen the COVID uh, disruptions be pretty significant over the last, you know, 18 months or so. Where do you think we are in terms of that uh, uh, pathway and especially in terms of the resilience of Jamaica? Um, <clears throat> cool. So, you know, first of all, I think it's it's very notable to note that the government of Jamaica in the height of the pandemic, when we saw, you know, surges of cases happening in similar type BPO facilities, um, you know, took a very hard decision um, at the time, which many of us were very concerned as to the outcome of that and what it would do for the, the industry on a whole. Um, as to what the market would think about it. But I, but I do believe that the collaboration that we had with all levels of central government, as well as you know, private sector and JAMPRA and other areas of the public sector um, and the, the Global Services Association, we were able to, to really put in place a set of protocols that, you know, knock on wood to this date, have been very successful. And, and I think it, it is, it is the, the move, in my opinion, that has further pushed Jamaica up, you know, to the higher echelon of the choices of whether it be vendors or clients in this, in this industry. I mean, we saw, we saw what happened in Asia and some of the other markets where things just got completely shut down with no sort of plan. Uh, but Jamaica took, you know, a, we took a tough pill for the first couple of weeks, but but we we developed a concerted plan that I think has really benefited us uh, in the you know the short, medium, and even the long term from a you know perception and, and what people has a have a perspective of Jamaica. So I, you know I want to just share that that um, you know feather in the cap for the government and the, the collaboration between ourselves and them. Uh Excellent. So two quick points off of that. This, this collaboration uh, piece does, does seem to be, at least from where we sit, to be pretty uh, remarkable. The level of coordination, the level to be kind of on the same page with all these different actors. Uh, how much of it is that just the fact that it's, you know, a relatively small population compared to the other markets? Or what are the other factors that make that collaboration so successful? So, you know, I think the fact that we are a much smaller market than many others plays a massive role, right? You know, you have greater access to the decision makers of, of, pol of who are driving policy. Um, so that plays a, a tremendous role. But I think it also, you know, when you look at what generates our GDP there is a certain level of understanding as to you know, how important the, the GSS BPO industry is for the country. So you know, it is something that has been developing from back in 2012 when I first started the business and you and I first started having interactions. 
that we saw that that transition from it just being an industry operating to an industry that can you know advocate and work with and communicate and collaborate with the public sector and the policymakers to make it successful. Got it. And, and also, just as a follow up to that, COVID has done all kinds of things to the BPO industry. It, you know, speaking at a at a very high level, Nearshore has done extremely well. You know, the the pace of expansion of this industry is remarkable across the entire sector. But it's also forced a lot of rethinking about uh, physical location, uh, working with teams, you know, and agility around all of that part of it. Uh, both both in part at ITEL and Jamaica in general. How would you see that transition or or the uh, you know, how, how decent a job did yourselves and the Jamaica BPO industry do in terms of adapting to these new circumstances and going forward? How do you see that workplace of the future evolving? Well, you know, so the first thing from an adaptation perspective is the fact that, you know, we went into like 80 percent plus work at home. So, you know, adapting to that was a big part of our early days success. Um, you know, as we go back into some, you know, more semblance of normality, I think, um, you know, somewhere where we're back to a 70% in center, 30% work at home kind of flex, flexible type of workplace scenario is really what is going to be this, the, the success for Jamaica and for the region for that matter. I mean, let's face facts. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our residential IT infrastructure is not as sound as, as what you have in the US for argument's sake, you know? You know, many, many across America, you can get gigabit circuits to your house. You can get fiber to your house. We're not, we have not reached that level in Jamaica or many of the places in the, in the region. So, so the fact is in order for us to get, you know, a more reliable source uh, of, of internet for our team members to work is that you need to either be close to town centers or city centers uh, in, in Jamaica and others in order for you to have a reliable internet. If not, you know, we, we've got to have those people working in the office to be able to, to continue to um, support our customers. I think many customers kind of went through a period where it's all about just get people on the phones. We, we need to answer the phones. We don't have enough individuals, which I think that that's what drove a big part of, of the explosion in, in Jamaica and in the near shore region that you're referring to. And, and I think now that, you know, that explosion continues, people are now saying, okay, well, we need to go back to meeting our KPIs. We need to go back to ensuring reliability within the infrastructure and the people that are providing services, which, you know, in my opinion, Jamaica has has done very well. I mean, in the height of the pandemic, we were we were at about forty thousand employees. We lost about seven thousand in the initial stages of it, and right now we're back up to forty five thousand employees. So you know, you've seen you know pre pre twenty twenty numbers, uh, you know, surpassing what we were at ending twenty nineteen. You know, as part of our our reason for diversifying through the region, you know, Jamaica is home. Jamaica is our, our single biggest market um, and biggest um, part of our business and will always be. But diversifying through the region is, is, is really what has put us uh, on the international stage and, and also put us in, you know, in greater competition with our competitors locally and in the region. Sure. You know, it, it occurred to me, Yanni, that we had discussions about work from home and your vision from work from home at least three or four years ago, right? Yeah. We, we had that conversation. So, th so it just occurred to me, looking back on how you viewed work from home, a remote workforce type of things, and seeing what we just have gone through the last 18 months, did it did it unfold the way you expected, uh, and, and and especially in terms of the ICT infrastructure, uh, has that always been the biggest concern you've had, or what, what what issues did you expect that came to be, and and what perhaps issues weren't such a big deal? So so um, yeah, I mean it's going back to 2017 when we first started having conversations about work at home. Um, 
A lot of it is, is, is what I expected. I mean, you know, in the very beginning, we, we pushed a square peg into a round hole and had to kind of make it work because of, you know, at that time it was, you know, protecting our employees and their families and making sure that, you know, we had safe working spaces, but there was social distancing to a very extreme point. Um, so we had to make it work. But, but yeah, the, the expectations are, are somewhat, you know, similar to what I what I thought was going to happen. And even from going back then, I was always of the opinion that it would be a percentage, not all of the, the, the workforce that would work from home or, or even the vast majority. So I would say that for the most part, it has ended up, um, you know, where I thought it would. You know, the, the hardest thing I think um, that we have faced in the, in the region with work at home is that that level of engagement, you know, that, that that you have with your team members as well as your team members have with their their you know their co-workers, that water cooler talk, that ability to you know go downstairs in the lunchroom and kick back with with your your colleagues or having lunch with your friends at work or the different engagement things that we used to do as an organization in center, you know, kind of kind of um switching to the model of, of purely work at home or at that point, 80% work at home, um, you know, it took some, some bit of a, of a learning experience, even for us who had prior experience before. Uh, you've been very intentional over the years about creating a, you know, sort of unique identifiable culture. And uh, I don't know that I, I don't like to throw words around casually about culture. You have to see it and experience it. I have been to your, centers. I do feel there's a unique imprint there. Uh, but again, uh, what, what have you had to do as a, a CEO founder in, as part of that adaptability to reinforce culture, to remind people of culture, to help them feel connected? Are there any specific things you felt like you needed to do uh, in the way you run your organization? You know, culture, is, like you say, is a big part of our organization. We, we do do it, I'd like to think, a bit uniquely, as you have said, uh, versus others. But I think a lot of that comes back to our Caribbean nature. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to invest and move into a country and set up a, an office or set up a business or even, you know, whereas, you know, when you're from the Caribbean and you are the, the founder and the leader of that, that, you're kind of instilling that culture, not only in your Jamaican offices, but in our case, in Bahamas and St. Lucia and Honduras and Mexico and Colombia and the US and Canada. It's, it, it's, it's a culture that, that people love and, and want to understand more of world, world, worldwide. I mean, you go back to, you think about what Bob Marley has done for Jamaica. You think about what Usain Bolt has done for Jamaica. You look at, you know, food brands like Grace Kennedy, uh, the hotel brands like Sandals. I mean, these are some of the largest brands individually or collectively in the world. And it's coming out of a little country like Jamaica. And I think we forget um, that that has a level of power um, that we don't really, you know, have a value to. But that's a big part of our uniquely different culture. It's just being Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's shift gears a bit. One of my favorite topics always is how uh, clients, obviously mostly U.S. clients, but not always. Uh, certainly, we're seeing a lot more U.K. type clients appear from out of nowhere, I have to tell you, even in the last week. But, um, but in general, uh, going back to, you know, those, those – uh, those interesting days uh, back in 27, uh, 2012 and now where we are today, uh, what's on the minds of clients? Are they coming to the table when they start to talk with you? Do you sense that there's a greater appreciation, a greater cur curiosity? Do you still think there's a lot more learning they have to do about Jamaica? What, what's sort of the lay of the land there? Sure. You know, from a client perspective, as you know, Kirk, they, they all do their own due diligence on everything. You know, the country that they're going into, the vendor that they're working with, the region. Um, so they have a fair, fair bit of understanding. I think, you know, many years ago, 
uh, Jamaica was misunderstood or more so misknown. It was just unknown to people. And, you know, as some of the larger international global companies coming in here kind of put that stamp of approval on Jamaica, it gave a, a sense of confidence and credence to it as a, a, as a delivery destination. So I don't think, I think people understand Jamaica these days and I think they know what they're going to get out of Jamaica um, when they outsource work to a vendor there. Um, but, you know, what I do see is, you know, clients, especially with a company like ourselves, where, you know, they're spread across different countries and similarly with our competitors, they're going where you, where you suggest to them, all right? They, they, they then become more, you know, believable in you as their vendor and what you're suggesting to them. So we have a lot of, lot of clout from that perspective. But what I see more and more happening now, even since, you know, through 2021 here is our clients saying, how much more can you do for me in Jamaica? How much more can you do for me in another one of your, your, your geographies? Because we really want to spread our risk uh, in the, from the Asian markets in the nearshore market, not only because of what maybe took place through the pandemic, but people also really are over traveling two days, three days to get to their centers. Um, and, and as more and more people are collectively starting up in this region, it's going to drive naturally more and more business to a country like a Jamaica, especially because of the brand names that are operating here. I mean, you've got the likes of Sutherland and IMEX and VXI and Conduent and, and, and you know, many others, Concentrics that, and Teleperformance that, as you know, are, are some of the largest in the world. Um, and that brings a level of, of credence to the destination that, again, you know, we don't truly value and understand. Uh, and along those same lines, it, it often I, I, I like to remind people Jamaica is the third largest uh, English speaking uh, country in the Western Hemisphere. And, you know, you've been uh, it's been noticeable for you, Yanni, in terms of some of the uh, locations of expansion have been native English. In, in terms of that native native English element, how significant is that in those conversations with clients and in terms of you know, a lot of this this business is about getting to the endpoint faster and more efficiently and at a higher, incrementally higher performance levels. How much does that mean that the native English is there? It, it, it's still a question that is asked on a, on a day-to-day -day basis when you're talking to clients. You know, they want, they want to understand, you know, they know reggae music, they, un, they know the culture just from it being out there and they want to, they want to make sure that the, the, the language is clear um, you know, there's, there's clarity in, in the discussion, but I think, you know, what really sets Jamaica apart, um, and, and, and I can say this not only be, being Jamaica, but be operating in other geographies, is that our ability to, to develop rapport with a customer is tremendous. I mean, you know, clients of ours that may have had a more scripted approach to their offering have dropped the script because the Jamaicans are able to, to really create a conversation with the customer, uh, really make them feel comfortable um, and essentially get the job done, not only in a more efficient, but in, in a, in a you know, more customer experience um, manner that really helps their brands to be elevated because of operating here in Jamaica. So <clears throat> yes, English and the clarity of it is a big point, but I think also where we take an edge is, is that ability to develop rapport and to service the customers better. Um, so, so one second, excuse me, we're gonna have to pause for a second. Okay, the, the train? That's it, yeah. Right. So, uh, Sorry, uh, hopefully the video the editor doesn't mind making that cut. So, so uh, about the clients, uh, Yanni, in the English, in terms of policy direction, uh, you know, how, how much does that influence policy going forward? And I think in general, how does Jamaica keep its kind of leadership position to where it is today? And how does policy support that? Sure. So, you know, you have, you have different levels of policy and, and, you know, 
the policy that that we operate under as a as a vendor is very different to the policy that that a client is looking for. So I want to try and break it down into like two sections. So if you take the policy on the client side of things, you know, they're looking at, you know, does your does your country have the um, the tools in place to continue to expand the workforce and the knowledge base of the individuals that will be working? They're looking at crime. You know, what 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 what's the level of crime in your country? Can we can our can our um, security and risk department approve it? I mean, we had a client the other day that said to us, "We can work with you in Montego Bay, but we can't work with you in Kingston." So these are all things that that they're looking at. Um, on a regular basis, they're also looking at you know the state, the stability of your democracy in your country, uh, which you know Jamaica has an extremely stable uh, democracy going you know predating independence in in the sixties. Um, they look at your 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 technology infrastructure and how that that comes into play uh, within their um, their mix of, and, and as well as facilities. That you're operating out of is is so it's one well that's one side of, of the policy, but when they make their decision and they say well we want to work with with ITEL inside of Jamaica, the po- other side of the policy then comes with us as a vendor. So you know that is where we operate under the special economic zone and we have certain you know certain privileges from that perspective uh, with regards to fiscal incentives. Um, and we, therefore, we need to, to focus on, on those things to ensure that, you know, operators can move very swiftly um, to set up, whether it be new facilities, expand additional uh, existing facilities, because when a client makes a decision, um, and, and what I've seen, is, you know, this year alone has just been insane from clients making decisions that they move very, very quickly. And if you as a vendor can't make uh, those decisions very quickly and move as quickly as they want you to move, you're going to potentially lose out on the business. And that, that's not only potentially Jamaica uh, or me as a vendor, but Jamaica as a, as a country, because I may be able to move faster in another country. The client is going to drive for that to happen uh, because at the end of the day, they got to service their customers. Um, we're, we're, we're in a highly competitive global uh you know, almost commodity-driven market. And if, if we can't move at that pace of, of what, you know, the, the market is asking for, then Jamaica is going to, to miss out on it. And I think as, as it becomes more and more competitive um, and people are transitioning more business to this region, it's going to be less about country and more about pace. And how, how fast can you get me up and running? Because like I said earlier, these clients know where they're going, where they want to go, what countries are, are okay, what countries are not. And then it comes down to pace of that vendor. And if that vendor can't move because of policy decisions or you know, things in place. So not saying that we don't, we don't have that in Jamaica, I'm just saying it's something for the policymakers to continue to think about as they're making decisions that are right by the country, that we take these things into context because it can, it can either benefit us or, or hurt us. And that reminds me, Yanni, you were one of the key uh, partners in the creation of the, uh, the uh, G- uh, well, it's called the GSA now, but it was no- known as something else originally, right? It was known as the, uh, the BPIAJ, the Business right. Process Industry Association right. in Jamaica. So, so what role it's... does, tell, tell me what role an organization like that plays in, in uh, reinforcing the need for that pace to be, uh, you know, to move in a direction of fric- frictionless support of your clients. Sure. I mean, it, it plays a tremendous role, right? Because the, the power that it has behind it is, you know, over 60 odd companies and over 45,000 employees these days, right? So it has, has a tremendous amount of clout. But more than the clout is it, it plays a tremendous role in ensuring that the policymakers are aware of these things, whether there are issues, whether something is working, whether there's something new coming out of another country, how can we pivot, how can we do better as a nation so that we can um, we can continue to capture that business um, as a country. So it plays a tremendous role, um, and not only from the policy side, but even from the perspective, as I mentioned before, um, 
on the, the employment side is making sure that Jamaica continues to produce the strong talent that it has always produced, um, which is, you know, there's a, there is a big program right now called the, G, uh, the Global Services Sector Project, which is uh, a loan that was essentially taken from the Inter-American Development Bank that Jambro uh, is running lead and point on it, but the GSAJ uh, association is, is right there uh, in line with, with Jampro to ensure that, you know, we are continuing to have a, a large pool uh, of skilled labor for, for the front line. We're upskilling uh, our team members to become supervisors and managers and center directors, as well as, you know, pivoting and transitioning to a more digitally driven uh, market services market. So, you know, that's a huge thing as well on the policy that that is a, a private public sector partnership that has been going for three years now. And it has two more years left before that project is over. And uh, a, a, a lot of times countries will, will declare we want to we want to up upskill or we want to uh, we want to move up the value chain and, and that's completely understandable one of the parts of that conversation I I sometimes think think gets overlooked as current clients you know many of them being very uh, satisfied with their partners in various locations will continue to to you know ask their partners can we do something with a bit more sophistication can you support uh, the process we see it envisioned, which means maybe more complex types of interactions and things like that. Yeah. When, you, when you hear about those things from your clients and then you reflect on what Jamaica is now and what it can be tomorrow, what, what helps you maintain that confidence? What, what insights do you have that the, the, the so-called labor pool, or, in, or maybe I may ask it another way, is the labor pool getting the kind of foundation necessary for so-called higher level skills, which oftentimes can be very niche and very subject to the unique characteristics of that client. So, you know, I think that we have, we certainly have the skill set, right? I think the biggest issue that we have as a nation to really moving into different services is the scale aspect of things, right? So if you take, if you take software development, um, and you look at like what India has done. I mean, it, it, is, we are, it is impossible. We cannot compete with India from a software development perspective. But like you said, is if we look at something that's very niche um, and you take, you know, not everybody wants a thousand software developers. Somebody may, may want 10 or 15 software developers. And if we can take that, that niche market and expand on it and say, you know, let's, let's take our, our sector from 60, uh, 70% customer care uh, to and 30% other services to, you know, 60, 40 or 55, 45. That's a huge success. I think as a, as a country, if we can achieve that. Um, you know, if you look at one of the members in the association today with, with KPMG, um, who has built out a, a massive shared services unit for of accountants that are doing various different services. I mean, it's it's untalked, but it's a, it's a huge huge success story for Jamaica to see what they have done. Um, because when you think KPMG, you just think auditors and you know in uh, external accountants and tax and this and that. But to think that they've actually created a shared service unit that's providing service accounting services for their clients all over the world. It's truly tremendous. And that, that is a, a success story for going up the value chain. If we can get more of those, um, and if we look at some of the other vendors in Jamaica that are, in fact, doing these types of services in other geographies and say, let's take a small team and test it out. Those are where we're going to start to see the transition and the pivot to you know, a higher value uh, market in Jamaica. Fantastic. And, and it sounds like ITEL will be part of that expansion for, for years to come. Do you, do you, you see yourself, Yanni, um, are you only in the second or third inning in and in a very long uh, journey ahead for ITEL? Yeah, man. you know, we're this year, well, June 22 will be 10 years old. 
Um, and I think I think the fun is only just beginning. Uh, as we say, the sky is the limit. Um, you know, we have positioned ourselves as a as a Jamaican company that is now international, that is you know, seeing ourselves at the table with some of the biggest names in this industry more and more every day uh, as we expand our offerings and, and basically take Jamaicans to the region to, to show what we have to showcase. And, um, you know, so our, our, our plan is to continue to grow. We are, we are just bucking on, on 5,000 employees as a company. And our goal is by 2025, to have over 10,000 employees in, in, in our organization. So as I said before, the, it's, the fun is only just beginning. Fantastic. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be there to record that, that, uh, that landmark moment, Yanni. I really appreciate your uh, time today. As always, super insightful uh, and, and great to see you again. Yeah, man, you as well, Kirk. And thanks, thanks for all that you do for, for our industry, uh, not, not only for Jamaica, but in the region. I know if we go back to, like I said, 2012, when, you know, around the same time, near shore America's was really getting going and getting traction. And, um, you know, just that aspect of being able to show what Jamaica can do and what the region can do uh, on an international stage through, through your, your firm has really helped to propel many of us uh, to success. So thank you for all the work that you do and have done for this industry. You bet. Well, it wouldn't wouldn't work without great partners. So we really appreciate that, Yanni. Yeah, uh, great to see you. And I'm going to cool. turn it back to the folks at the Do Business Jamaica Conference. Thanks, everyone. Take care.